everybody. We're on with Ben Peterson and George Huber. This is Biomass Energy Journal. George Huber is an expert in green gasoline, and we wanted to talk to him today and find out about the latest cutting-edge research that his team is doing. Welcome to the show, George. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. So if you could give us a, a little background on who you are, what you do, and, and how you're helping to make a better biofuel future for us all. So uh, I'm, I'm a professor of chemical engineering at uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and uh, the, the focus of my research really is to uh, make cheap renewable gasoline, cheap renewable uh, jet fuel, cheap renewable diesel fuel, and chemicals as well. And uh, we're developing innovative processes that are novel processes to, that we believe will be the low-cost processes to make fuels and chemicals from renewable resources in the future. Great. So tell us about your work uh, with green gasoline and ex expand a little bit from there if you could. Sure. So, so uh, if, if you look at most of the processes that uh, convert biomass, usually they're complicated, multi-step processes. So uh, we've come up with a single-step process that where we can feed in solid biomass and go directly to a gasoline additive. Uh, we call this process catalytic fast pyrolysis. And uh, this is, this is a, this is a very simple process. We add uh, solid biomass into our reactor, and uh, in, in, in this reactor, the, the biomass pyrolyzes or, or thermally degrades. Uh, so just with heat, it thermally degrades, and we have a, a, what we call a, a zeolite catalyst in there. And inside the zeolite catalyst, these pyrolysis vapors are transformed into aromatics, uh, CO, CO2, and water. And uh, so we have a single-step process to go directly from solid biomass into uh, uh, aromatic compounds that actually turn out to be more valuable than, than the gasoline itself, but can be blended into gasoline directly. Oh, that's very interesting. So with, with most biomass technologies, it really comes down to, you know, sizing and moisture content. There's, it's, it's so particular, and biomass is such a wide spectrum. Does your process overcome any of that, or are you... Are you still facing some of those same same issues is that and is that part of the the challenge for scale up we our 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 process can work with essentially any biomass feedstock so we can work with agricultural waste we can work with woody biomass uh, and we can work with energy crops and we have done experiments with all with all of these pro, with all of these different feedstocks uh, the the before we feed the biomass into our reactor we do want to grind it down to a certain particle size. We, we, and that helps improve our yields. We don't have to grind it down, but you definitely see a yield improvement. And then we like to dry it off, remove the moisture before we feed into the reactor as well. Okay. And then uh, give us a little background on your, um, your temperature ranges. So you're undergoing pyrolysis. What's, what's kind of an average temperature range that you're breaking those down into, into oils and, and Perhaps what, what what percentage of char are you getting as a byproduct? If that's yes, so so so, so the temperature range is anywhere from forty to four four hundred to six hundred degrees C. These are high temperatures. Now all the heat you need for this process comes from the burning of our byproduct. So one of the byproducts we make is char, okay, and we burn that byproduct, and that gives us all the heat we need to drive this reaction, as well as remove any water in our process. Or as, and, and we also have some excess heat that we can convert in electricity, and that gives us the electricity we need to run our grinders, to grind the biomass, as well as any compression costs we might have. So our process is totally energy neutral. All the energy comes from drying the biomass. We do make, we do make coke. We, in, in, in our overall process, we don't make any coke because we use it all internally to give us the process heat that we need. Perfect. Okay, and depending... The, Depending on depending on the type of feedstock we have and the moisture content of our feedstock coming into our biorefinery, we we would actually be exporting, uh, we'd be making aromatics and then we'd also be exporting electricity. Okay, perfect. What scale do you see this going to in the future? Is this a multi-million gallon um, installation type of thing, or do you see this on a on a smaller scale? Who's I I, I see. Your, your, your economics definitely get better as you go to larger scale, like, like most processes. I see this being implemented on, on, the large, on a larger scale, 
uh, that, that you'd have refineries that would be similar to your size of your pulp and paper industry. You'd be making maybe 100 million gallons of uh, aromatics per year at each, uh, at each of these different uh, refineries. Okay. And so for your process, are you using, if you can tell me, are you using indirect gasification or are you using um, air from, from the, just the atmospheric air? We we don't we we're not doing any gasification, so we don't need we don't feed any air or any oxygen into our process. Uh, we 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 do burn the 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 coke with air to give us the the heat that we need for our uh, process. But it's not it's not a gasification process; it's a pyrolysis process. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry I didn't didn't address that because there's a there's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so. For the chemical industry, what do you see as some of the the chemicals that are that, that are high value, even maybe perhaps higher value than biomass? So, than, so um, if, uh, if green gasoline. Yeah, if if you look at the chemical industry, there's six major chemicals that are the bulk commodity chemicals that all the other chemicals are made of. That really are the okay. feeds that where you where you take from you take your petroleum refinery. And you 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 know you, you open a nozzle and you make these six major chemicals. In our process, we make five of those six major chemicals that we make. So our process, our technology can be used to make gasoline, but it can also be used to make the chemicals that supply the the basic chemical industry with their chemicals. So the chemicals we make include benzene, toluene, xylene. Uh, ethylene and propylene, and we can adjust which chemicals we want to make as well. That will change depending on the market conditions. Cool. And so, in our process, you know, let's say the price of uh, the the ethylene and, and propylene goes up, and the, the the price of our other products goes down. We can adjust the amount of those products we make. Okay. Yeah, I was talking with one uh, biomass energy company, and uh, they were actually making, um, I think, phosphate replacement chemicals for the, um, the dishwashing liquid industry because there was a, a change to go to phosphate-free, and they were um, doing really well with that. Hmm. Yeah, well, we, well, we believe uh, that, uh, we, you know, we, we believe that uh, we'll, we'll be able to make all those bulk commodity chemicals from, from biomass resources, and we'll be able to replace these petroleum-derived uh, chemicals. And, and and that's very important because a lot of these chemical companies, you know, when the price of oil goes up to over a hundred dollars per barrel, then they need to get other sources of their feedstock. And they're all the chemical companies are all really relying on one source for their feedstock, and that's uh, uh, crude oil, and and in some okay. cases natural gas. So I bet they're very eager to to help you along and and ensure their uh, survival and their growth uh, with having good available feedstocks then as well. Yeah, we we we've had lots of interest uh, from from a wide variety of companies. Very cool. So I thought you had a lifetime grant. Is that kind of what you're working on right now to refine your process and, and uh, get it to, we, uh, a pilot scale? Yeah, we we have several research grants from uh, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, to really optimize this process and to help move us forward in in commercialization. Uh, since I've been a professor here at UMass, we've received over $9 million in funding uh, to, to, to work on this project. We're really trying to approach this project from every conceivable angle. We're, 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 we're designing new generations of catalysts. We're do, doing very sophisticated modeling of what happens in, inside the reactor, inside the biomass. And uh, we're, we're, we're doing first principle quantum chemical calculations that allow us to see what's happening within the biomass and the catalyst. So really we're doing scientific studies at almost every single level, scientific and engineering studies, and this helps us, gives us a competitive advantage to design these new sophisticated process. And we have uh, a lot of sophisticated tools that have been developed in the last, uh, only in the last several years do we even have these tools that have been available to us that we've been using. Uh, you know, we're, we're using insight gained from nanotechnology to design new generations of catalysts, as well as combining that with uh, uh, computational power to model the reactors and model the chemistry. So it's, it's, it's a great wow. field to be in, there, and we still have lots of questions that, that we're uh, addressing and answering. Yeah, what are some of those questions, and what are some of the technical hurdles that, that you're going to face as you uh, scale up this technology? 
you know, I mean, the, 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 overall, the overall challenge is, is the yield. So how, how do you increase the yield of the process? How do you get more aromatics per amount of biomass you put in there? Okay, and so that comes into what type of catalyst do you use? How can you, how can you adjust these catalysts at the molecular level to make targeted products? And then how can you synthesize such catalysts? Uh, the other important part is how, how do you tune the chemistry? Because you have all these chemical reactions that are happening. So we're developing these sophisticated models that have all of these uh, reactions happening in here. We use a special type of reactor called a fluidized bed reactor. And uh, in, there, in there you get lots of, you have a gas that mixes with the catalyst and mixes with the biomass. And uh, so, so there's lots of this, the physics going on in there is, is very interesting. And, and we're using uh, a type of code called computational fluid dynamics code to really try and model that. In terms of, of scaling up, we believe the tools that we've developed and the models we've developed will help it make it a lot easier in or, to, to scale up our process. Uh, you know, a lot of these scallops are done by rules of thumb. Well, we have uh, these sophisticated tools where we can model that larger scale reactor and tell you how we think it's going to perform. And we can tell you, you know, where, where we think the bottlenecks in, in that process are. And, cool. and, and, and you know, we're, we're in the chemical engineering industry, so we understand how to scale processes up. And we understand uh, the chemical engineering industry. We, we've done this with the petroleum processes. We've done this with processes from natural gas, the chemical industry. So now biomass is just another feedstock for us. And we're applying all the same tools that chemical engineers have been using for the last uh, 100 years for refining uh, petroleum feedstocks to refining renewable feedstocks. Excellent. What's the timeline for getting something like this to market? Is this 10 years away? Is it 15 years away? When can we start to really see green gasoline in the pumps? And if you tell us a little bit, why is, why is green gasoline so important? from an energy density standpoint and, and infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the, the first commercial plants are probably four to five years away where you see the first oh, wow. commercial plant. Now, before it start, the consumers start seeing it at the, in large amounts at the gas station, you're probably talking 10 years away because these are all very capital-intensive projects. Uh, ener yeah. Energy is a commodity. Okay, and, and, and uh, so, so to make a big impact, you have to see a, a large investment. But then I think you're going to see a large return on your money because you're betting on the price of oil being high and the price of yeah. renewable energy being lower in, 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 in the future. Uh, so, so that answers that question about when do we see it. What was your next question? Uh, about the energy density as opposed to, say, like an ethanol. And, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Well, like green, green gasoline is so important. Our infrastructure because of the way it ties in. Yeah, that's right. We're we're making the compounds that are already found in gasoline. So you don't have to make any changes at the pump. You don't have to make any changes okay. to your engine. We're making a fuel that you're already using. So we're making the same compounds that are already found in gasoline. So there's really there's really going to be no difference at all to the to the person. Uh, you know, really, we want the consumer to pull up to the gas station and not even know they're putting in green gasoline into their car. Uh, and, 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 and they'll think they're just putting in normal gasoline. The only difference is the source where they buy that gasoline. It'll be coming from renewable restocks as opposed to uh, petroleum. And that concludes our interview with George. We want to thank George for taking the time to be with us today. He was a great guest. And I want to tell you listening and watching to join us on October 12th for the Biomass Fuel Summit in Portland, Oregon. A lot of important things are happening in the biofuel sector that you need to know about.